record on this computer. There we go. Um, so you guys know this is recorded. Uh, however, the recording does not capture chat. So uh, anything you say in the chat will not be on the recording. However, we may say uh, the questions that you ask out loud. Um, if you have a question that you absolutely do not want to attach your name to whatsoever, um, you will be able to do that through the Q&A. There is an ability to be anonymous there. However, anything you post in the chat, you will have your name attached to it. So just FYI. Um, again, your mics and your cameras will be off by default. Um, I ask you again, if you have any questions or uh, want to say anything, feel free to uh, uh, type it in the chat. Um, and yeah, we're going to get started here. So uh, for those of you who have not joined us before, hello, my name is Heather Bobrowitz. I am the uh, programming librarian here at South Texas College Library. And uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of uh, sharing our time with uh, Dr. Colleen Georges. Let me tell you a little bit about her. So she is a positive psychology and life and career coach, a TEDx speaker, and she's the founder of Rescript Your Story, LLC. Uh, she's also an eight-time award-winning author of Rescript the, uh, Your Story, uh, or Rescript the Story You're Telling Yourself. The Eight Practices to Quiet Your Inner Antagonist, Amplify Your Inner Advocate, and Author a Limitless Life. She has her doctorate in counseling psychology from Rutgers University, where she's also a part-time lecturer. She has over a dozen coaching and counseling certifications, and her expertise has been featured in various media, including the Huffington Post, Thrive Global, Forbes, and Mashable. And as I said before, she's joining us today from New Jersey, where they did get some snow, but thankfully the weather has not prevented her from joining us today. So I am now going to leave you guys in her more than capable hands. Uh, if you do have have any uh, technical issues, just type them in the chat. I will be hanging out, keeping an eye on that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Heather, <laughs> for inviting me and for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, it was probably like a couple hours ago. My my son was like, you know, he's 14. And he's like, you you got anything else you got to do today? And I said, well, I'm going to Texas later. <laughs> he's like, what? I said, but via Zoom. <laughs> so it's great to 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 be here with everyone tonight. Um, this is a topic I really, I really, really love to talk about. Um, you know, talking about passion and purpose and how do you sort of find that? I think so many folks, um, you know, that I encounter just, you know, are trying to trying to figure out what they love. Um, and and I'll I'll say that as a um, a career and a life coach, a lot of the folks that come to me, in fact, most of the folks that come to me, um, come to me saying some variation of and, and they are anywhere from usually 18 to, you know, in in their 60s and um, either at the beginning of their careers, the middle or towards the end. But many of the folks I talk to say some variation of, I don't know what I want to do, but I know it's not this. And, um, and so the reason I really like to talk with folks about this topic, especially when you're in college, um, and I know that not everybody here may be a traditional student, you might be, you know, right out of high school, you might be coming back after several years. But, um, you know, it, it's great to be able to, to learn what you love to do, what you really enjoy, and what feels meaningful to you earlier in your career. Um, or at least if you are coming back to college, to find it now, <laughs> um, because sometimes we end up doing things that we realize aren't necessarily our passion, and um, and we we spend a lot of hours of our lives working, so we might as well like it. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my PowerPoint and share my screen with everybody. There we go and get into the slideshow at the beginning. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let me make my stuff smaller here. 
Okay, so discovering your career passions and purpose. Um, so when we're young, um, from about as early as probably many of us can remember, the adults in our lives start asking us, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and I, I always think this, this meme is hysterical. When I grow up, I want to be a firefighting veterinarian, rocket scientist, movie star. <laughs> and so when we're kids, we usually do have like a whole bunch of different things that we want to be. But I also, and you may feel this way, um, I encounter lots of people, you know, in college and beyond who are still like, there's so many different things I love to do. There's like so many things I could imagine myself doing and it's really, really hard to choose and I don't want to pick the wrong thing. Um, so this which way, this way, that way is like the big question and it can feel, you know, utterly terrifying at times to think like, well, what if I choose the wrong major and what if this isn't what I love or, you know, what if I choose to study something and, you know, I graduate and I get into it and I realize I don't like it. Like, what do I do then? Um, I feel like, you know, we can feel like there's a right way and a wrong way. I guess I believe that all things that we do are information um, and that no matter, no matter how long it takes for us to maybe realize that we've picked a, a major that isn't the right fit for us or, even graduated and, and selected a career path that doesn't feel like it's right for us. Or maybe it was right for us and now it's not right for us anymore. Um, there's nothing lost. You, you know, with everything that we do, we gain information about ourselves and what we enjoy and what we don't enjoy. So there's really no right or wrong. Um, so in terms of how we initially sort of select a career path, you know, it usually starts with you know, obviously like certain influences, um, money is a big one. I'm just saying, you know, to Heather right before we started that, um, I, I talked to many students and, and, and I, and I do still teach at Rutgers, um, you know, who are very much looking for careers that are going to pay a lot of money, you know, sort of, sort of selecting a major or a career path based on what's going to be the most lucrative, you know, going to afford you the best kind of lifestyle and there's it's not that there's something wrong with that it's just that it's only part of you know only part of the things that really should potentially be influencing our career decision making um yes we're going to need to pay rent or a mortgage and we want to be able to live a nice life and you know not be necessarily paycheck to paycheck that that's the the sort of ideal vision we'd like to be able to go on vacations and do things and buy the things we want to buy and eat at the places we want to eat so money does matter um but it's definitely only one of the things that um that matters in, in career decision making i think another big one is sometimes prestige you know like a, having a title that people really respect right so doctors and lawyers um are often among those titles that that um, you know we think about to say, oh, if I were a doctor or a lawyer, that would be really great. You know, um, I would, you know, command a lot of respect. Um, and also things like being like an entertainer in the media, right? Like that's another thing I think that carries prestige. Um, other common influences of our choices lifestyle balance um lifestyle you know again how how can i go on vacations can i go out to eat um you know can i live you know a nice life in a nice home drive a nice car balance um can be part of lifestyle meaning can i have enough time to spend time with my family and my friends and do the things that i want to do um, will this career afford me that ability our parents obviously are a huge influence or whomever raised us, right? Um, could be grandparents, guardians, parents. The, you know, these are the folks that start to tell us like, oh, I think you'd be good at blank or you should really study this or you should, you know, you should do this for a living. Um, social media obviously is another big thing. What we see on social media, what we see other people doing. Um, I think that's also, you know, influenced influencers um, and people who want to do things uh, like on YouTube and TikTok, uh, previous work experience. So if you've had part time jobs throughout the course of like, you know, high school and college, you know, we start to get an idea about what we like and what we don't like. 
um, any existing career knowledge that we have, you know, that we gained from, again, what our parents did for a living, what other people in our family did, um, what we learned maybe at career fairs growing up. Um, required education is another big one. Some folks are just like, hey, if I'm going to need to go to grad school after my four years of college, forget it. I don't want to do it. And that might cut out some career paths. For some folks, um, for others, you know, they might say, I'd like to do a career that doesn't require me to go to college and let, rather do a trade. Um, and, and then other folks don't mind necessarily or like, hey, I'm, um, I'm in it to win it and I will go and get a graduate degree or, or a, a Juris Doctorate or a medical degree. And what we know are, are our strengths and our skills, what we know we're, we're already good at, right? We've demonstrated either through classes or on jobs. Um, or in other places in our life that we have certain strengths and skills and that influences our choices too. Okay, um, so in terms of you know, the, obviously what we're talking about today, uh, passion and purpose really have a, a, the greatest, most positive long-term impact on happiness. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about different perspectives on work. So perspectives on work, there are three kind of, and this is something from the literature out there, um, three kind of main perspectives on work, a job, a career, and a calling perspective. So a job perspective, and there's no right or wrong here. So even though we are talking about passion and purpose, it doesn't necessarily mean that one of these is right and the others are wrong. Um, they, they're all valid. But um, a job perspective is more the idea of, you know, I'm looking to do something that you know, as long as I'm pretty good at it and, you know, it's not really stressful and the people I work with aren't awful and it's not like to a toxic work environment. And, you know, I've got time to do the things I really care about after I clock out of work. That's good enough for me. As long as it pays my bills and it's not awful, um, work isn't really like a, made, made, like a massive part of my identity and, you know, I, that's really what matters. I can pay the bills and it's, it's not so bad and I'm pretty good at it. Um, that's a job perspective. A career perspective is more the idea, you see the ladder there, right? It's, it's I want to be able to learn and grow. I wanna do something where I can keep learning and growing. I can climb that career ladder. I'm gonna get promotions um, in title and money. I'll learn new things. I'll take on new projects. Um, I would like to enjoy what I'm doing and enjoy the learning process um, throughout my career. That's, that's a career perspective. And a calling perspective is really about this idea, a little bit more about this passion and purpose, um, but purpose in particular. It's about meaning. Wanting to do something that feels really meaningful to you, something where you can make a difference. You know, maybe it's like in, in the environment or for animals or for people. Um, but doing something that you feel like you can see the impact that you're having and it feels like a calling, you're called, you feel called to do this kind of work. So these are the three perspectives on work. And those with the greatest career satisfaction fall, as we might expect, somewhere in this little sweet spot in here, um, where it's a little bit of everything, right? It pays decently enough, it's not too stressful, you know, the hours are reasonable. Um, you know, it's, it's a decent work environment. I get to learn, I get to grow, I get to see myself achieving and climbing a ladder, um, earning more money, you know, gaining um, different titles. Um, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I like what I'm doing here. And it's, you know, meaningful to me. I feel like I'm having a positive impact and I can see what that impact is. So this is kind of where the sweet spot is. Not everybody is gonna choose to do something that has all of these things in common, but those who feel the happiest in life and work tend to have a little bit of everything here. Um, so calling uh, you know, equals passion and purpose. Purpose is the reason you journey, passion is the fire that lights your way. So, this is a lot of questions and a lot of words on the screen, and I am not uh, expecting you to memorize all of these things, but um, I will uh, make sure Heather has a copy of the PDF of this presentation that can certainly be shared with you. And I know you'll have the video as well, so you'll be able to see these questions. But um, 
questions to ask yourself to kind of get at um, passion and purpose. What moments in my life or work, uh, or what moments in life or work have left, uh, have you felt you were fulfilling your greater purpose? Um, if you didn't have to worry about money, what would you spend your time doing? Uh, what values help guide how you live your life? What problems in the world do you wish you could solve? What adversities have you experienced that you'd like to help others get through? How do you most commonly enjoy helping others? If you could write a book to help the world, what would it be about? If you could teach others anything, what knowledge would you impart to them? What positive impact do you want to be remembered for? And actually, that's a big one. I, I want to mention there's an author that I really like, um, Michael Hyatt, and he does a lot of, he writes a lot of books on um, like managing your time and, and goal setting and things like that. And um, he, he talks about life planning. And one of the things that is part of this life planning process is a pretty, pretty um, intense process uh, uh, for this life planning, but is thinking about, you know, when we pass on, right? What do we want people to remember us for? What do we want people to say about us? Um, if you could have just one positive impact in your workplace, what would it be? What work projects or tasks do you enjoy so much that you lose track of time doing them? What service projects have you done or wish you could do and why? Why do you do the work that you do? <clears throat> and that could be, again, if you are, you know, working at a job, what is it that keeps you there? You know, is, is it just money? Do you have to do it? Or is there something that's more meaningful to you about that work? What matters most to you about your work and its contribution? So what do you want to be contributing at work? And, and like, why is that important to you? <clears throat> what work activities give you the greatest sense of meaning and purpose? What work activities do you enjoy so much that you lose track of time doing them? When you, when do you feel the most engaged and motivated and what's your why? Um, why, you know, why are you doing the things that you're doing? Why are you in college? You know, why are you studying the things you're studying, taking the classes you're taking, engaging in the things that you're engaging in at, in college outside of the classroom, right? Like, why are you getting this degree? What is it that you're, you know, hoping to achieve and really thinking about your why, you know, and, and, and why the why is really like what fuels us to kind of like be the people that we want to be in the world. Like, why, why do we do all the things that we do? Like, what's the ultimate goal for us? And I think the, I just want to check the chat and make sure, um, <laughs> yeah, don't get frustrated with someone who doesn't have the same passion you have. Yes, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> um, it's true, uh, right? Sometimes people are just like, how could you like that? Or why would you want to do that? Or you would be really good at this. I don't understand why you're doing that. But it's really about like what fuels us, like what lights us on fire. And we all, we're all very, very different. Um, oh, what if we enjoy something we're not skilled at? Um, well, we can build skills, right? Um, and we, maybe we, uh, well, I know we'll probably get to these questions later, but the good thing is, is we can build skills. Sometimes there's things that maybe we um, enjoy doing, but we don't necessarily have the skills just yet. Other reasons, this is really important to know your why, your passion and your purpose. So Gallup does these annual surveys uh, of, of employees across the nation, across, they do one nationally, they do one, a global one. They do a lot of different surveys, but one of the things they look at is engagement and disengagement. And in 2018, um, I, I probably need to see if they uh, didn't, you know, if I can get more recent data, but they're usually pretty similar. It's been going down over the last several years, but 53% um, of workers out there that are surveyed are disengaged. So more than half of the workers out there are, don't feel engaged in their work. Um, which means that they feel bored or disconnected from their work or their workplaces. 13% are what they call actively disengaged. Actively disengaged means we're not just bored, um, we're 
so unhappy that we might even be trying to we we might be in a, almost in a place of creating a toxic workplace <laughs> if you've again heard of a toxic workplace or ever experienced a toxic workplace when we have extremely disengaged workers they start trouble <laughs> so um, and make it harder for other people so there's another reason we don't want we actively disengage people and we certainly don't want to be one of them and only 34 percent of workers out there feel engaged in their workplace um, which which is a, a pretty low number we certainly want to see that change okay so let's get into some resources now so this is where we get into how do i figure out what i enjoy doing what you know what's what i'm passionate about what i'm interested in what feels purposeful to me um some of you may be aware of um what's called the um my next career no, uh, move interest profiler or may have um heard of uh holland's career profile um it's one of the oldest and longest standing ways to look at our career interests and it's still the best one out there in my opinion and probably according to most people who do what I do. Um, the great thing about it too is there's a free assessment. Um, this My Next Career Move, 60 questions, not, you know, it's not like an overwhelming uh, career assessment. It doesn't cost a thing. Um, and the, I think the thing I love the most about it is that usually when you take one of these assessments, whether it's a personality test or a career test, right? It's like it gives you some results and it tells you this is your career, this is your personality, you know, you're a, a, you know, an INTJ and it's kind of like, okay, great. So now what, <laughs> what do I do with this information? A lot of the time we take these assessments and we don't know what to do with the information. Um, this one actually connects to something. So you take your, uh, your results, it, it gives you some information uh, about your results and it'll, it'll start to tell you like, you know, if you're, and you see the, the the different six areas over here. Let's say you are highest in social, artistic, and enterprising. You know, it'll be like, you know, if you're an SAE, these are some of the jobs that you might enjoy doing. And, and then you can take it to another level and you can go to this site right here, ONET Online, and um, click on interests and you can plug in your interests and you can plug in just enterprising and look at a list of you know, career paths that um, anybody, you know, who uh, is high in enterprising would like to do. You could look at any of these individually. You could look at a combination of, of you know, two of them, enterprising and social together and see what folks who have those two as their highest like to do. And then you can combine all three and narrow it down even further. Um, but you're usually going to be looking at your top three areas, especially if your top three are, you know, let's say, I think the scores go all the way up to a 30 or a 30 something. So if you have, if you're enterprising, social and artistic, and it's like 21, 22 and 24, well, they're all pretty high. So um, you probably wanna look at the combination of all three and see what career, career paths folks who um, are high in those three like to do. Um, and you might find that you have some that are really low, like my realistic is is really low. It means I probably don't want to do a lot of outdoor manual labor. <laughs> um, and, you know, for some, they, some people even, I think, can get a zero on some of these. <laughs> it's possible to get really, really low numbers. It's actually good when you take this assessment. It's great when you have some scores that are really, really high and some scores that are significantly lower because it lets you know like you you do have a preference you know that you have a preference for certain things quite a bit over others um, some folks also experience having what we call a flatter score and a flatter score is when you um you your scores kind of are all around the same number right career decision making can be a little bit more difficult when we have a flatter score because it means that we either like a lot of things or we don't like a lot of things. So then that's when we need to dig a little bit further. Um, but this is uh, this will you know kind of give you an idea about the places you can go. You can take the assessment here. You can plug in your interest areas here. You can click on them, and it'll tell you all kinds of things about jobs. It'll give you a list of jobs, and it'll be like, you know, you click on it, it'll tell you. 
this is what you do every day in, in quite a bit of detail. Do you work outside? Do you work inside? Do you travel a lot? Are you at a desk? Um, you know, what skills do you need to have to do this? Uh, you know, what kind, what kind of education do you need to do this kind of a job? Um, what kind of money can you make at this job? Uh, what else? It'll, you can break it down by state. It'll show you like across the country, what's the average salary, but then you could look at specifically Texas. What do folks make in Texas if they do this job? So it gives you a whole lot of information. It's really, really great. Um, and it often might, you know, introduce you to things that you've never heard about before that you don't know a whole lot about. So, um, this is one really, really useful way of learning what your interests are. Just gonna look at the chat real quick. Thank you, thank you, Heather, for putting those links in there. Yep, faith, faith, passion, persistence. I love that. Okay. All right, so here's another great resource. Um, this gets at your work values, uh, and it's called the California Career Zone Work Importance Profiler. Um, it is not just for folks who live in California, and it is for everybody, and it is free. Um, it starts to, it helps you look at what things, as you can see here, uh, achievement, independence, recognition, relationships, support, working conditions. Which of these things are the most important for you in a job? Um, you know, for some, having a job where you can really see what you're accomplishing is one of the most important things. Some folks feel like, you know, they want to do something where, um, you know, they don't get bothered too much. They're not micromanaged. They can be really independent. For others, recognition is super important. Quite frankly, recognition is usually high for a lot of people. Um, most of us, um, do tend to like to have a supervisor uh, or other people that we work with who appreciate us and say, you did a really great job, or, you know, there's a pay raise maybe associated or just a real, you know, again, a sort of pat on the back to say, like, you know, you did a great job on this project and I'm really grateful to work with you. Um, relationships can be really important to folks, like just feeling like you want to work with people that you really like or um you, you know you want to feel like you kind of have a work family um support can be very important to some you know just feeling like you've got colleagues you work with that will you're willing to help you out and be there for you um train you mentor you and working conditions um you know that's obviously like making sure that if you work in a physical space and you're in an office that you know that you that it's heated <laughs> and it's safe <laughs> And, you know, like, or, or, or it's a nice office, it's, you know, cushy and, and pretty. So, but it, it varies for all of us. So this is another free assessment you can take to kind of get a sense of what your top work uh, importance values are. And, um, and you do the exact same thing at this link, you can um, plug in your top work values based on your scores and see which, you know, career paths might best match up with your work values. Um, I always say that uh, while both of the interest profiler and the work values um, allow you to do this plugging in, I still feel like the interest pro profiler taps into, you know, sort of like a match for you a little bit better. But I do think it's nice to look at both and kind of look at your combined scores and, and, and see what comes together in terms of, you know, job titles and stuff like that. And then um, again, you sort of plug that in, you go in here and you can read about different jobs and, and you know, develop a list of what's interesting to you. And then we can take it a step further um, to narrow things down and gain more information. Another great site you may have been to before potentially, a couple of them, is the Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Outlook Handbook. Um, or the Occupational Employment Statistics site is another good one for further research. And you know, once you, you kind of take your list that you developed from, from taking the other two assessments, you can go here and get even more information. So the, these sites are almost like an expanded ONET. ONET was the site I mentioned earlier that you, know, you can plug into and it'll give you like, here's the jobs and this is all the information about them. These two sites take that even a step further. They're really, really comprehensive. And also sometimes the Bureau of Labor Statistics site 
occasionally has job titles that don't show up in ONET. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, the way I came to realize this is that they've got life coaching in there, but ONET does not have life coaching in there. Life coaching is a newer field in the last like, you know, 20 years, even though 20 years doesn't seem very new, but ONET hasn't added it yet, but they're regularly adding new job titles to, to their batch, but uh, BLS is quicker to do it. Um, and then I always say here, step three, go on LinkedIn and research people who work in potential occupations of interest. Connect with people working in, in roles and in industries, write them a brief message requesting a short informational interview. Honestly, another great way to do this um, is go to, and I, I have this actually at the end of the presentation, I've, I got the link for, um, uh, for South Texas uh, LinkedIn page, and you can click on the alums. You can basically click on alumni and it'll show you folks who've graduated from STC, reach out to them. Because when you reach out to somebody who is a graduate of the school that you're going to and say something like, you know, hi, so-and-so, I see that, you know, you're a graduate of um, South Texas College, you know, I'm currently a sophomore at, at South Texas College and, you know, I'm studying X and I see that you did too and you're working in, you know, blah, blah, blah field. I'd really love to know more about what you do. People are, are more likely to respond to your message if they are an alum of the college that you are an alum of or that you go to um, versus just writing to any person. So you should feel comfortable writing to anybody, but I think South Texas College alums are gonna be more likely to respond. And it's, you know, it's always nice to connect with alums. Um, Crafting your work around your passion and purpose. There's this thing called um, job crafting that I, I, when I learned about it many, many years ago, I just found it really fascinating and did a lot of reading and research on it. And it looks at a few different ways that people craft their work around their passions and purpose. And there's three things, right? There's task crafting, um, relational crafting, and cognitive crafting. So task crafting is when we, it's a, kind of what it sounds like, you're trying to find ways that you can do more of the things, the actions, the tasks that you found that you really enjoy doing. Um, and, you know, and de depending on what we do, we might have a job that has a few different facets, let's say. And maybe the thing that we do most of the time isn't the thing we enjoy the most. But the thing that we is really only 10% of our job is the thing we enjoy the most. So part of that is figuring out how can I come up with ideas that I can pitch to my boss <laughs> that get me doing more of the tasks that I like doing and make sure that my boss realizes that it's win-win for everybody. Like, let's show how this is good for me, but how it's also going to be good for you and good for the organization and good for the department. So that's task crafting. Relational crafting is how can I develop relationships with people who work in this company or organization who are doing the things that I really like to do. So maybe I, let's say I'm doing a sales job, right? But I really like marketing, right? And maybe, maybe you're doing, I don't know, maybe you're working while you're in college and you're doing something in sales but you're studying marketing and you're interested in learning more about marketing and getting some marketing experience. How can you create relationships with folks in the marketing department? Is there a way you can see if they might be willing to mentor you or have lunch with you and, and, and again, do some informational interviewing or maybe um, do a collaborative project? Is there any way that you can collaborate with them that makes sense for both departments? Um, but it's again, creating relationships and cognitive crafting. This is the easiest and the hardest. Um, I know that sounds weird. Cognitive crafting is how do I but refocus my perspective around what I do, right? So how can I think more deeply about how my job is having an impact that I feel really proud of, right? So if we focus too much on the parts of the work that we do that doesn't feel meaningful 
people are interesting to us. Um, we can start to, you know, feel down at work, frustrated, bored, you know, a lot of negative emotions. But if we start to think, how am I positively impacting my organization? You know, um, let's say I'm in IT, you know, right? I, I could think, you know, like I'm, I'm, and I'm stressed out and I've been having some challenges at work. Well, if I change my perspective to think, well, I, if I do help desk, you know, I am having a positive impact, you know, on my fellow colleagues here, because if I didn't do the things that I did to, you know, set up their computers and their software, then they wouldn't be able to effectively do their jobs. Um, and, you know, they would be dealing with technology problems that are driving them crazy and making them feel frustrated. And I'm the one that's solving those problems, right? We could say that about any job. We can think about how what we're doing is making an impact, or maybe it's making an impact on the clients that you serve because of the services that you provide. We don't always even have to be directly providing something to the customer or the client to be able to start to look at what it is we're doing that ultimately is gonna positively impact that client. Um, so I always tell my students to go into each new work opportunity and my clients thinking, what do I wanna learn and what do I wanna contribute here? So always go into every internship, field work, work study, part-time job, full-time job, any experience you have contemplating, what do I wanna learn here? And what do I wanna contribute here, right? Um, learn because you wanna start thinking, who do I need to make relationships with? Who do I need to talk to? Um, what trainings do I need to get involved in? What resources are available to me that are gonna let me learn what I need to learn to develop my resume, develop my skills, you know, help me for, the next opportunity, um, engage me. And what do I wanna contribute here? What do I really like to do and how can I do more of it? Like, who do I need to talk to <laughs> to um, get involved in the projects that are gonna allow me to, to contribute here in the ways that I want to? Like, what legacy do I wanna leave behind um, when I'm not here anymore? Um, and again, how am I gonna get the most out of this experience? It's, it's about both the experience as well as the way these experiences build your resume for the next thing that you do. And then devise a plan to discuss with your supervisor. Um, if you go into work experiences, like I said, including field work and internships, thinking like this early on, you'll get into the habit of doing it for the rest of your life. Um, I kind of treat, I started like informationally interviewing like everybody when I was in graduate school. I didn't even know that that was what it was called, what I was doing. But if I saw somebody who was doing something cool, um, you know, I, I was at school um, no, starting to notice that I kind of liked the idea of working at a college. And, and I did for many years, uh, you know, in graduate school and afterwards, and I, I obviously still teach. And I started, you know, asking people if I met somebody who ran a workshop, I would talk to them afterwards and say, you know, hey, could we get lunch? Or I would say, like, how did you come to do what you do? How did you get here? What did you study? You know, what did you do before this? Like, how do you break into something like this? Um, but I think starting to do things like that, as well as making sure that anytime you have an experience um, that you're already thinking, what do I want to get out of this? And what do I want to learn? You'll do it throughout the course of your career. Okay. Um, so this is, this is one of the most important things aside from the assessments probably <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I think of from, from this entire presentation. Um, how can you immerse yourself in the things that you love and that are meaningful to you? Um, soak up everything that you can at STC. Like there's, as a college student, there's so many things available to you um, that your tuition dollars are already paying for and you might as well soak it up. Um, this of course, you know, right? Attending workshops, the fact that you're here tells me that you're doing that. Um, keep doing what you're doing. So one thing, Go to career and employer services. Um, you know, there's people obviously you may have done this already, but um, 
who can talk you through major selection, um, talk about job shadowing, field work, internship, externship, part-time job opportunities, and certainly as you're graduating, help you to um, you know, be looking at graduate programs or um, looking for full-time jobs. There's just so many resources there. When I was an undergraduate, I did not utilize those resources. And then ironically, um, I, well, I shouldn't say I ended up because uh, I will tell you to say yes to lots of things and soak up as many experiences as possible. Even sometimes if you don't know that you want that experience, check it out and find out. Um, when I was in graduate school, I went to my advisor uh, because I was very interested at that point. I thought that I wanted to work with teens and families and do like family and adolescent counseling. I was in a counseling uh, doctoral program. And I went to my um, advisor and I said, do you know of any opportunities around campus where, you know, I can work with teens and families and get some experience? And she said to me, well, I don't off the top of my head know about anything like that. But my friend and colleague over at Rutgers Career Services is looking for an intern. <laughs> and this was in 1997. And I, I'll always say that question I asked her and going and meeting with her colleague at Career Services changed my life completely. Um, I was not interested in, in doing this internship. I did not. I'd never gone to Career Services as an undergrad. I was like, what is this career counseling stuff? This does not sound fun. Um, I ended up interning there for two years, and then I ended up on every job I ever had after that, pitching to my supervisors if I could provide resume and career coaching services to the students. And then here I am, you know, 2008, I started a business doing resume writing and career coaching. So completely changed my life. And I'm still friends with my supervisor um, from there to this day. Um, go to career services. They have so many great resources, and here's the links. Get involved with student activities, organizations, leadership academy, government. There's so many things that was all over your website. There's just so many amazing things that you have access to um, that you can get involved in. The things you do outside the classroom mean everything, right? It's like if you can, you know, get on a um, on a on a board for a student org or get involved with student government or leadership academy. It's like these are such great experiences that start experiences that start to let you know what you enjoy and what you don't build your resume give you like create relationships that are going to be so valuable to you um but they and they open you up to like things that you may never have thought like let's say you're in a student organization and i don't know you get involved with doing their um their social media marketing you know and 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 that wasn't something you were interested in, but maybe you find out that you're really good at it um, or you just really love it and it's a lot of fun and it just comes easily to you. Maybe that points you in a new direction of something that you might, might enjoy for a career. Um, meet with your academic advisor, course selection and planning. Um, don't try to do everything on your own. It can be easy to kind of just go off by yourself and try to figure it out, but it's useful to talk to somebody who can give you ideas, who can also talk with you through, hey, if you like this class, you know, you you might also like this class or, you know, help direct you. Sometimes academic advisors might direct you to career services and say, you know, maybe they can help, you know, like make a connection with you really enjoyed these classes. Maybe you like might, might like this major. Um, talk with faculty. You know, if, especially faculty members in your major of interest, potentially, or any courses that you're taking that you think you're interested in, or you really like the professor, you know, go to their office hours, ask to set up a time to meet with them. Sometimes it can be intimidating, but it's so worth it. Like those relationships can be so great, especially if you have a really cool professor that you really like. Um, talk with them. You could ask them about majors, you know, they might tell you about unique opportunities that you, you never would have found out about otherwise, give you some guidance. They let you know about their background. How did they get to be there? Did they, did they work in industry before? You know, um, do they have other things they do outside of the university that they're involved in? Um, you know, what led them to teach in the first place? What, what opportunities they know about that maybe you can get involved with? 
Um, I mentioned earlier connecting with STC alums um, to get career path advice, and this is that link where you can find uh, alums of STC, um, as well as things like study abroad, you know, the opportunity to, uh, when I was just talking with somebody at a, a like a Mardi Gras party over the, <laughs> over the weekend, and, um, you know, her daughter is in London right now, and we're just talking about you know, when in your life, it's so rare that, you, you know, we will have maybe an opportunity in our lifetime to live abroad just for a period of time, right? Just for like, say, six months or a year or something like that. It's harder to do that when you have like family commitments and a mortgage and, you know, roots and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, if you can actually take the opportunity to like live and study in another country for a semester, uh, you know, what a really great, amazing thing to be able to do. And volunteer, it's another great way you can find out maybe what you love to do. Uh, this volunteermatch.org is the best website that exists out there for uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, you can sort it by population that you'd be serving, like, you know, uh, seniors or youth or um, people with addictions or um, or animals or the earth, you know, you could start by, uh, you could uh, sort by skill area, like you want to do something finance related, you want to do something marketing related. Um, but basically, there's tons and tons of nonprofits out there that are looking for people, you know, to basically provide volunteer and provide a free service and, the, and you name it. In, in all likelihood, many of the things that maybe you potentially might be interested in or majoring in, there's probably some nonprofit out there that's looking for somebody to do that. And volunteer Match is a really, really great place to find that. And, okay, I'm looking at the time, make sure I leave time for questions. Um, and finally, your passions and purpose will evolve, continuously reassess them. Uh, you are not going to choose something, the what do you want to be when you grow up idea, I'm going to pick something and I'm going to do it for the rest of my life, is really kind of antiquated. Um, it, you, maybe it was always antiquated, but people just followed the rules. <laughs> but I think now we understand a lot better that we change, we evolve, and we should evolve with our, the changes in ourselves. And we, you know, people these days have multiple careers in their lifetime, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a more interesting, rich and rewarding life, you know, if you allow yourself to to make changes as your interests and passions change. Be a lifelong learner. Always soak up learning opportunities, you know, like places like Coursera online where you can do free certificates or free courses or paid courses that, you know, take you four weeks or two months or something like that and something new that you're interested in or Udemy where you can you know, take a class for 16 bucks on something that's interesting to you, but just always be a lifelong learner, both for the, the reward of doing it and the interest of doing it, but also for your resume. Um, don't be afraid to re-career. I work with folks that are re-careering, you know, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s. Um, it's possible. Uh, I, I just spoke with someone today, a new client, whose husband um, went back and got his uh, doctorate in psychology um, at the age of 50 and is now in a new career as a psychologist. So there's literally never a time that's too late. Indulge your passions through your hobbies. Um, the things we love to do don't always have to happen in work. They can happen outside of work. And because we have many passions, um, you know, I think it's like, you do something for your career, but then there's your volunteer work and then there's your your hobbies, right? So volunteer in your community and beyond and, you know, make sure you have hobbies that you engage in. Create a side hustle. Um, this, this um, you know, biz that, business that I've been doing full time since 2010 started out as a side hustle in 2008 uh, while I was a full time director, department director at, um, at Rutgers University. So sometimes starting something on the side that you're really passionate about, you know, where you can make money doing what you love to do. And it, it might just be a teensy little bit of money. You know, you never know. It could be a, a thriving side hustle that you keep for many, many years that you love. Or it might be something like me where you, it, you know, you, you find that it's doing so well and you love it so much that you're, 
willing to walk away from whatever else you're doing in order to make it your full-time hustle. And big thing, don't wait, initiate. Um, and that means don't wait around for opportunities in life. Somebody, the, the right moment, the right time, you know, the right time to ask the question or have the conversation or, you know, uh, to make the move, to move, to move out of state, to move to a new job, to, to do whatever. There is no right time. Um, and there's, and waiting, you just never know that anybody's ever going to approach you about that opportunity at work or that project. Often, if we don't say we want it, if we don't indicate that we're interested, if we don't initiate it and do something about it, start the conversation, the thing never happens. Um, or if it does, it happens way later. So always initiate. Don't wait for the right time. Say, say what you want. Tell people what you're interested in doing. Make it clear. Make yourself visible in your workplace, in, in the classroom, and, and beyond. And um, this is about defining your passion and purpose. Uh, you can actually create a little passion and purpose statement. Um, my purpose is to blank. I fulfill my purpose through my passions of, and I've got my little statement here. My purpose is to help others see all the good within and around them so they can make their unique positive impact on the world. I fulfill my purpose through passion, my passions for teaching college courses and women's leadership, presenting career and life development workshops, providing life and career coaching, writing self-help books, and volunteering in the community for causes that matter to me. So it's, you know, the personal and the professional, right? So my purpose is to, and I fulfill my purpose through my passions of. So you can take this and kind of make this your own and define that for yourself. And it helps to, to like I said, I think create a sort of rich, balanced life where you're, you're doing the things that really are meaningful and interesting to you in many, many spaces of your life. And just a question to ask yourself, um, what first step will you take this week um, or today or tomorrow to craft your career around your passion and your purpose? And I will stop there for questions because I see there are a bunch. Okay. And I will pop back on to help out with moderating questions. So we <laughs> did have one in the Q and A. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what if we are afraid of choosing the wrong path when we thought it was the right one? <laughs> um, I think like like everybody is afraid of choosing the wrong path <laughs> um, because you think it was the right one. And as I was kind of saying earlier, I don't think there's a wrong um, because you learn something about yourself. So every time you go into, even if that means you choose a major and right, you, you realize like way far into it, oh God, I don't like this. I don't even think I, I want to do this. Or you, you suddenly do an internship in something. You're like, um, yeah, I can't see myself doing this every day. I hate this, right? We all have the, I had that experience when I did my first externship. I was like, oh my God, this thing I thought I wanted to do my whole life is not what I want to do at all. What the hell do I do now, right? Um, so it's, I think it's a very natural feeling with majors and career paths. And the best thing I can say is try to get experience. Um, try to either volunteer or do an internship and externship, part-time job, field work, soak up as many experiences as you potentially can trying things out. If there's anything you're thinking of, try to try it on if you can first and see what you think about it actually and talk to people who do it, right? Informational interviews, so try it out, talk to people. That will help you with decision-making. But the reality is, the what if I am afraid to make a, the wrong choice? Sometimes we do make a choice that we find out isn't a fit for us. And sometimes people end up working in those fields for many years before they decide to do something different. There's nothing wrong with that. You will gain transferable skills. You will gain information about what you love and what you don't love. And it will benefit you in some way. You'll, it will teach you something. So there isn't, there, there isn't anything lost. Sometimes it feels like time has been lost, but you've not lost anything. 
Yes, thank you so much. Um, I would probably equate it to um, the whole idea of uh, love and loss. You know, it is better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. Each time you're in a relationship with a person, you're learning about what you want in a relationship. Um, and it can be the same thing with a career. You can try out a job and then realize, oh, I really don't like going into an office. I really don't like um, interacting with people um, all the time, answering a phone, etc. And then you start to understand what is going to make, you know, going in and spending eight hours at a place enjoyable for you, or at least tolerable. <laughs> exactly. You got it. That's such a great way to put it. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved I guess I'm, I'm thinking of Valentine's Day since that's tomorrow. <laughs> um. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we have another Q&A question. Yes. What can we do if the thing that we like demands a lot of time, but we don't have yes. that time? Hmm. Uh, I mean, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, if there's any, if there's any way to get a snippet of something, it's, it's great if you can, but if it didn't, I mean, I'm not sure if, if maybe more clarification might be needed there, but, um, if you don't have the time for, for something, you can try to rearrange your life a little bit, certainly. Right. I mean, like I work with people a lot on, on managing their day and sort of creating schedules for themselves and, and getting a hold of their time. And a lot of time I've found in my own life and in my clients' lives that the things that we think we don't have time for, we can create time for. There's lots of things that if we were to get up earlier or we were to get more sleep and weren't so exhausted, or we were to spend less time watching Netflix, I'm not saying get rid of it because I love television and Netflix <laughs> um, and Hulu. And, and I'm not saying get rid of social media because I also really like social media, but sometimes less of it, right? We can always do a little bit less of the things that we're doing that are stealing our time because there's plenty of those that we seem to find time for um, to create time. But the reality is, yeah, you know what? I know there's some folks here that are juggling full-time work and and full-time classes and and potentially families too. So, you know, and, and what do you do when that's the situation when you're trying to get experience? you see, can I at least talk to somebody? Can I job shadow somebody? Maybe just spend an afternoon somewhere, right? Something that doesn't require me to be present for hours that I don't actually have. Okay. Um, another question, if my workplace is a toxic environment and so is my next career option, should I still go for it? What feedback <laughs> do you have for burnout? Oh my goodness. I, I I I wish I could say that there is one thing you can do to magically not have a toxic work environment ever again in your life because I have yeah. experienced that myself, but yeah, oh goodness. <laughs> so I'm gonna yeah. leave this to the professional. Um the, the, the reality is, I mean you said it, Heather, right? You the, the hardest thing, um one one thing I'll say with a toxic workplace, because toxic means a lot of different things. It, it, it means having a boss that micromanages, a, bo a boss who could be verbally abusive. Um, I mean, it could go to that extreme. Um, a boss who doesn't, you know, who, who is commanding of your time all the time, who is um, cool, non-complimentary, um, you know, ridicule. I mean, it could be a lot of different things, or it could just be... Um, it could be that you work with people who talk a lot and gossip and, you know, kind of create a negative space. You're overwhelmed too many hours. So it could mean lots of different things. So I think that the first thing I'll say is that, you know, whatever boundaries you can create, start creating them. No one is going to um, love it when you do that. And there will be backlash probably, but I mean, who else is going to create boundaries if we don't? Uh, that's just the truth of it. Um, create the boundaries that you can create, even if it's very, very uncomfortable to do so, number one. Um, do not engage in the negativity that's coming your way, whether it is from colleagues or wherever it's coming from. Instead of being defensive or engaging in a back and forth with it, 
let let it be done in your direction and you just as i think of it as like put on a mask and don't breathe on breathe in the poison i think sometimes we end up defending ourselves a lot but i this but i that we do this in our personal relationships too um but we start to defend and defend and that pulls us into the negativity so i'm not saying like be a wimp and a pushover or anything like that but you know the truth is the more we engage in negativity we're not solving anything nothing is getting better for us put the boundaries down put your mask on don't engage in the negativity um and don't don't try try to not hold on to it you know when you when you leave that space so that you're not it's not filtering into other parts of your life work is a part of your identity it's not your whole identity um but there are certain things that yes you're not going to have control over uh and that's just the reality of it but we do what we can in terms of and I know the next thing I'm going to go into isn't great either. So this is the frying pan into the fire scenario. Um, if the next frying pan is not as hot, I mean, you could, you could give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> um, some people do that as a transitional thing. It's a transitional job. I'm in such a terrible situation, but the next one's probably not going to be great either. Not the right fit for me. I'll jump into it for a period of time, but I will keep on looking. That is a scenario that I sometimes suggest to folks if the situation is that bad. You know, we could be we could be looking for a while before we find like the right sort of culture and home um, in a workplace. But yeah, if the next place is not as bad, cool. You could give it a shot for a period of time and use Glassdoor um, as much as humanly possible to learn about the environments that you're going into before you apply for jobs and interview for them. Um, find out what people are saying about the workplace uh, because you know, there will be plenty of people out there that will tell you if this particular you know, office in this location is really awful or it's really great. Thank you. Yeah. So there is a comment in the chat that said the most important thing that works for me is the support from my family. But then we also have a question that is, what if we choose a path only because we don't want to disappoint our families? That's a tough, that's a really tough one. And, and I think because, you know, one, I want to say that the Western view, right, in the United States is this, you do you, right? Uh, and, you know, don't listen to your parents and do, you know, like you choose your own path. And like, I, I used to be so inclined to say like, that's the only way. Is you choose. But the truth is, it isn't the only way, you know, I mean, sometimes if there's realities where family is, is, of course, it's very important to us. And let's say there's situations where, you know, maybe culturally, it's just not really acceptable to, 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 to choose something too far outside of that path. You always start by trying to have the conversation, right? You know, and I think if you're going to have a conversation with family about a different opportunity, that's not what they want you to do. You start with information, right? You don't just go in and, and say, I, I just want to do this. That's what I want to do. You come in with a whole bunch of information. Here's the research that says that I can make this kind of salary and I can do this kind of thing. This is the pathway. Show, try to show them. Show them you've done your homework. That could help. If it doesn't, you try to find the compromise if you can, um, particularly if this is a situation where, and this is, I, I've had students where their families literally would disown them if they did not, like it was that bad. And if that's the case in your family, you know, you know, is first, then your family is first. So I would never tell somebody, screw your family, you know, um, that's, that's not cool. But the truth is most of the time, most of the time, not all of the time, it will be disappointing. They will be upset with it for a while and they may treat you not great for a period of time, but they will move on and you, you will be okay. And, and your relationship will be okay. It might suffer for a little while, but usually it's not, you know, um, detrimental for the relationship with your family forever. In that case, if you know that that's probably the greater likelihood, it's just going to be uncomfortable for a while between you and your family, then choose what you want to do. Awesome. 
Yes, those boundaries are important, not just at work and not just in like romantic relationships and whatnot. They're, they can be very important with family too. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you. Um, one more question. What if we enjoy something we're not particularly skilled at? <laughs> Sorry, I saw that question. Um, and I think I started to say that 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 actually, you know, I've gotten that question before. Try to start developing your skills, right? If you really like something, it, it makes me think of, and this is not a career, but it makes me think of I I like bowling, you know, and I really liked bowling when I was in college. But I was an awful bowler. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right? really awful Gutter balls. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and I got on a league with some friends who like needed another person. And it was sort of like a pity thing. And they let me on. And I never became the best bowler, but I got better and better. And I let the people there like as hard as it was. And it, as much as it wasn't natural for me, um, I... I did all the things they said. I stood in the ways they said to stand. I changed the way I held the ball. I changed the way I moved my arm. That's true of career paths too, right? There may be some things that we like to do that just don't come naturally to us. And it may be harder to try to make your brain, your body or whatever, do that thing because it just isn't natural to you. It doesn't mean you can't get better at it. And I've definitely worked with, with clients who have had that situation they were interested in something or liked something that just didn't wasn't natural for them but they they took the courses they got the mentorship they did what people suggested and they got better at it yeah I would say like a lot of artists say um talent is great but that's not what gets you ahead that's not what yeah. gets you to um where you want to be uh what that what gets you there is practice. Yeah. And I would say that if you want to do something and you're not very good at it, that's wonderful because you're starting right down here and you get to go up. You, you get to get better and better and better at it. Um, it's like I say with folks of like, you know, I you haven't seen this movie. You haven't listened to this song. You haven't listened. No, no judgment or anything. It is a thing of like, oh my gosh, you get to experience it for the first time. I'm so excited yeah. for you. You yeah. know, you get to experience excelling at something and getting better at something that you were not just born able to do. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's amazing. That's something you yeah. really get to accomplish. And so. I think so many of us experience that throughout the course of our lives. Like I, I just got really interested in the last couple of years in ecology and environmental science, but I have no science background whatsoever. I mean, I barely took any science in college. Like I didn't take the, I took the bare minimum in high school. So I did these certification courses last year and I earned two certifications in environmental stewardship and ecology at the age of, you know, 48, you know, and, and a whole different thing. I volunteered, you know, for the whole summer doing water testing because I'm trying to learn, you know, right. It doesn't come naturally to me. And it was very mind boggling to my brain, but that's what we do. And it feels good, right? It feels good to know you're trying to do something you care about when it is hard for you. So I think there's a greater sense of achievement attached to it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Colleen. This was amazing. Um, thank you again uh, for everyone for coming and attending. Um, those of you who uh, did attend with us tonight, you will be getting a certificate in your email. Um, that should happen in the next 48 hours or so. Um, so you will get that. Keep an eye out for the email that you used when you uh, registered for Zoom, because that's the one that all that gets gets sent to. So, um, and if you do not get it within the next 48 hours or so, feel free to reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat here and uh, feel free to reach out and uh, find out what's going on and I will try and chase it down for you. Um, I will also uh, send along uh, uh, Dr. George's uh, promise the uh, PowerPoint to us. Thanks.
you know, very generously. Thank you so much. Um, I will send that on to everyone who is with us tonight, again, through your Zoom, whatever email you used for the for the Zoom registration. And yeah, so thank you guys so much for attending. Um, and thank you for spending your time with us. And thank you again to Dr. Georges. Thank you no. so much, Heather. And thank you, everybody, for your great questions and, you know, the chat. And just have a fabulous night. And I, um, if you ever have questions, I, my email is in there, too. So if you ever want to reach out, please do. All right. Okay. <laughs> thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Good night.